Good morning. Happy Sabbath to you all. We have several announcements to bring to your attention. And I just want to say thank you for those that are here. Welcome. Glad you're here with us. Um, if you're watching online, uh, welcome. Glad you're here with us this morning. And uh, um, so let's uh, get started with our announcements. First of all, we have some transfers. Uh, Eddie, Lexi, Lorraine Lewis from Cleburne First, and Jean Priest from Cleburne First, and then Janelle Lawrence and to Keene, and Susan Talley to Burleson. Is there a motion to accept these transfers? We got a motion, second. All right, all those in favor, all right, we thank you. We hate to see people go, but we love to see people come too. You know, so we have both, so welcome. Uh, and, uh, um, Glad you're part of our family today. Um, tomorrow, our, our Pathfinders are having one of their fundraisers, Mod Pizza Fundraiser, there in Burleson, right there by Kroger's, if you don't know where it's at. So uh, you can go to Mod Pizza, order your pizza, and tell them you're doing it for the Joshua Pathfinder Club, and they get 20% of your sale. So, buy a pizza to eat tomorrow, buy one to take home, buy two or three more to put in the freezer. You know, and it's, you know, uh, it, it's good. So, let them know for the Pathfinder, Joshua Pathfinder Club. Also, Pathfinder meeting tomorrow evening. Our Pathfinders this morning are out doing activities uh, today, so that's why they're not here with us this morning. Uh, this week, coming week, we have our men's ministries on Tuesday, our adventure meeting on Wednesday, and so we're staying very uh, busy. Uh, next Friday evening, youth outing to the Promise, which is the youth and juniors, and if you want to be part of that or help to sponsor some of our kids who maybe don't have the funds for that, please talk with Laura and or Cynthia Friesen. We have a revival week coming up. How, how many of you like revival weeks? You know, it's good. Uh, Linwood Spangler, I, all of you should be familiar with him. If, if, if not, he used to be the evangelist here in Texas Conference. Before that, he was the evangelist in Pennsylvania Conference. And now he's a pastor in Pennsylvania Conference. And he's going to be here talking on the Holy Spirit. Right, Mark? Holy Spirit. So all week, I'm going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. And uh, it begins that week. And Mark, come and tell us what it's going to lead into for our church camp out. Okay, good morning. So, so one, and, and, and I'm not, I'm correcting myself in the way I put this information across to our uh, church staff. The revival will go through Sabbath evening, okay? So the revival starts here, but it doesn't end Thursday night. So if you want to get the rest of the story, if you will, from Linwood, come, whether it's just driving out, spend some time and coming back, either way, if you want to camp, either way. But it's going to continue into Friday night, Sabbath morning, Sabbath evening. So there's three more there that you can come out and join us at the camp out. Whether you camp or not, doesn't matter. Come on out. It's a core park. We don't have to pay per person every time you drive in or anything like that. So just come on out and join us. If you're not camping, love to have you because he's going to take it all the way through Saturday night uh, with, the, uh, with the messages that he has on the Holy Spirit. And so just want to bring that up to you. Also, um, the signups are still out there. We still have uh, uh, the shelters are gone. Uh, we have one more RV site available. If we get beyond that, and, and there, so forth, then we can, we can see if there are more available. Um, and, and we're asking if you've got a, a, a RV site or a shelter, which I think shelters have already, everybody's already paid for those. If you have an RV site, if you could pay for that uh, real soon for us so that we know for sure it's taken. And then if we need to go beyond that, we're not double booking and then winding up with some empty spaces because someone couldn't make it. Um, and then uh, there's also a sign up out there for, for day. If you're coming out like for Sabbath, We'd like you to sign up out there so that we know how many to expect and know, you know when it comes to food preparation, that sort of thing. And, uh, and then there's also whether you've signed up for a shelter, for a 
a tent camping or for an RV camping or day or whatever, there's a sign-up sheet for food items. So if you would mind just selecting a food item out there that you'd be willing to bring and, uh, and you might just, uh, most of that we're going to probably have you bring it here early so that if you show up late but your meal that you had food for is happening, we don't, you know, eat haystacks without beans or cheese or whatever it is that, you know, that uh, somebody's wanting to eat. Did I say haystacks? I did. Okay. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty much it, but just check the signups out there. We'd love to have you all out there. And again, uh, with the exception of the RV sites and the shelters, uh, the rest of it's come no matter what. If you, can, if you can donate, great. There's no fee required. It's just, you know, on a donation basis if you can. If you can't, that's great too. We'd still love to have you there. Okay? Look forward to it. All right. Thank you, Mark. I um, want to ask uh, the, this question, and uh, uh, so far I haven't had anybody email me, text me, or even talk to me uh, in person, but if you are interested in a meal, um, a like a fellowship meal, um, uh, the question is how many would come, if, uh, because we have to do all food preparation on site. We have to limit the number of people in the kitchen. We, you know, have to have spacing with tables and people. And uh, if that is something you would like to see happen, um, let me know. If, if not, like I said last week, if there's just a few people, then we can do potluck at my house. And we don't have to prepare it on site. Yeah. I'll let you bring all the food. Yeah, uh, some of you aren't getting it. <laughs> we'll, 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 let you, we'll let you know later uh, about that. You know, so, uh, all right. International Children's Care. I just want to say thank you to everybody that has been donating. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> Michaela James came to do a pickup and... Uh, well, let's just say we have more stuff than she could pick up. It, you know, so praise the Lord for what you're, you're, you're doing. Um, but if you are interested in uh, giving anything else, you can give uh, this, this week. Uh, they did tell us uh, a couple of things they were uh, looking for. But if, if you would like to, they're looking for kid-friendly toiletries. And some of you know what that means. It is not head and shoulders. Anybody know what that means? Kid friendly? Toilet? You know, like tear free? You know, some things that are kid friendly rather than, oh, adult, this is what I use at home. You know, so think what younger kids would need. You know, for toiletries rather than maybe yourself. You know, because as we get older, probably our shampoo and soaps have changed. I don't know if yours has, mine has, you know, over the years. So we've got to think kid friendly. All right, so if you want to help uh, with, with that. Self-defense class, uh, you can see the insert uh, there in the bulletin. You can take that, fill that out, uh, turn in uh, funds. Uh, people have been asking me, uh, ladies have been asking me when there was going to be another one. And, uh, and so we're doing a self-defense class for women on Sunday, October 18. But then after the last women's self-defense class, I had men asking me, well, what about us? Well, we're going to do a men's self-defense class on Sunday, November 8. So how about that? So men, your prayers have been answered. So uh, you can learn how to do self-defense, you know, even with the women that know how to take you down. So there, there you go. So uh, uh, no, I'm just, uh, it, uh, self-defense as a, uh, you, you know, if uh, you know anything about uh, Billy Smith and uh, those that are going to be putting it on, this is never to be used against somebody. It's only to be used in defense and to get away. 
So uh, the, the goal isn't to, uh, to hurt anybody, but to get away. And so looking forward to that. Our, tonight, if you are able, I hope you are, uh, at 7 p.m. to tune in to either our, our Facebook Live or online to awr.org, backslash Bible tonight starts unlocking Bible prophecies with Cami Ootman and her series is going to run through October 17. So tonight the series begins. It's being broadcast in our area. Our church is one of the ones registered. So if there are people in the community watching it, they're going to contact our church to let us know. Yeah, so we can connect with people in the community that uh, may be uh, interested in, uh, in watching tonight. And the last I knew, there are at least 40 churches here in Texas Conference that have uh, signed up to be connected with it. You know, so, uh, um, so we're looking forward uh, to that. And uh, if you know anything, a lot of things have gone online for people to connect uh, with, with that. And uh, also this week, uh, we've started a, a advertising campaign to the community online, um, Facebook and Instagram, uh, asking people if they're interested in Bible studies. So that's just starting this week. And so we're looking, if you want to you know, possibly help with that, we can talk to you about that. All right. Offering, giving opportunities. If you would like to give, um, because of the COVID time, we do not and are not passing an offering plate here in our sanctuary. But we have an offering plate out on the deacon's desk that you can place offering into if you would like to. Or you can give multiple different ways. The drop box by the pastor's office, uh, online, or even snail mail. You know, some people still like to use the post office, and Skip says thank you for using the post office. You know, so uh, you, you keep him employed, you know, as long as you keep buying those stamps and, and sending it in. So, um, uh, so there's many ways to give. So just a question for those that are viewing online. Uh, let us know where you're viewing from. Uh, it, uh, we, we like to know where everybody's at, where you're at, and um, it is uh, fantastic. We've seen people from uh, the Baltimore area, people from Ohio, people from Kentucky. Um, I, I've seen people from all over. I've even had some friends tune in from Thailand. So it, it is fantastic, uh, the number of places. And if you go to our Facebook Live area and you start looking down the number of places that our, our, our team is saying Happy Sabbath to, most of those names I don't recognize. It, you know, so take a look at it and see where you're viewing from. Let us know where you're viewing from. And uh, we'd like to, you know, say welcome to the Joshua, Texas Seventh-day Adventist Church from wherever you're at. Weekly prayer and praise, Saturday evenings at 6, Wednesdays at 7.30. Um, tune in, but, if, but over the next couple of weeks, we know we have the evangelistic series with uh, Cami Ootman, so tune in. Um, multiple things happening all at the same time. Today, for our Garden of Prayer, if you have a prayer request or a praise and you'd like to uh, send it in to either my phone or Pastor Isaac's phone or uh, as, as well on Facebook Live or YouTube chat. If you'd like to mention a prayer request or a praise that you have, uh, please send them in. I know already this morning I have at least two on my phone already, you know, from members who have said, hey, we want to be part of it. And so uh, please let us know. All right, this morning we have our songs of worship. Uh, Cynthia Harbour, along with uh, Crystal Penna, is going to lead out for us in our songs of worship this morning. Good morning. So Crystal has graciously said she'll help me because some of these songs I'm not quite as familiar with. So the first one we're going to sing is, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. Of the Lord with 
mercies of the Lord forever I will sing all the mercies of the Lord. And our next song is Mansion Over the Hilltop. our opening hymn will be Oh Praise You the Lord, hymn number 20, and please stand. Oh, 
takes a joyful noise and he hears beautiful music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Please bow your heads for our opening mm -hmm. prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for everyone that is able to be here today and for everyone that is able to watch us um, praise you through the internet and other means. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you've given to us this week, the wonderful weather that we've had. Um, we ask that you continue to bless us in those little ways. Lord, please be with the sermon today. Um, help our hearts to be open to the words that you speak through Isaac. Um, thank you, Lord, for everything. In your holy name, amen. All right, please be seated. All right, let me move back over here so we're more central. All right, we have our quiz today, and uh, Clarissa is going to be leading out in the quiz, and it's going to be from Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 to 11, uh, is where our quiz is going to be taken from. And the quiz questions this morning and answers are from the New King James Version of the Bible, if people wanted to know that. So depending on what version of the Bible you have, uh, so we're all, all ready to, to go. All right. Well, yes. All right, our first question today from Matthew 23, whose seat did Jesus say in the scribes and Pharisees sit in? Did I say that right? Say the scribes and Pharisees sit in. Hmm. The hot seat, the president's seat, Moses' seat, or the king's seat? Mm. So, have some hands. All right, we have some hands already of people answering. They're like, oh, we know this, you know, uh, this one. And uh, it looks like everyone's holding up a W. Oh, well. Yeah, that's sign language for a W. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. The White House? Yeah, yeah the, the White House. Oh, presidency. White House, you know, W. The presidency, okay. Yeah, you know, the, pre the presidency. Um, but, uh, yeah. But, I'll go uh, ahead and read the verse here. All right. The hot seat sounds nice. Yeah, yeah. It would be a nice booty nice. warmer like in the car. Yeah. Travel down. Especially uh, in the winter. <laughs> yeah, up in Morris for the winter. Yeah, yeah. All right, so this one was found in Matthew 1 and 2, or well, 23, 1 and 2. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So, yes, number three. Uh, so those of you that had that W, you were right. Three. Good job. Uh, Moses' seat. Yeah. All right, question two. What of the scribes and Pharisees are we not to do? Their works, their singing, dressing like them, or their praying? Ah. So what are we not supposed to do? And this one's found well, in verse 3. Well, it, yeah, that's uh, very I interesting. Um, well, the temple actually had hired singers. So probably because they didn't want to sing like the scribes and Pharisees. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. You, you know, um, and uh, well, they, they dressed Sorry, to the hilt. Like yeah, nobody dresses like them, <laughs> you know. Um, Jesus did warn about their praying. He, 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 did, have he, he did have, you know, you, you know, they prayed on the street corners and, you know, to be numerous seen by, words. yeah, numerous words and everything. Um, see any hands. And know, who really so, wants to do their work? Yeah, yeah, who wants to do their work? Yeah, <laughs> and that, that's right. Yeah, nobody wants to do. Any All right. guesses on well, this one? Any guesses? Who, who, who's right. got some guesses? It, uh, assuming. Number what looks one, like see what the Bible says. All right. See All some right. ones and threes. All right. And some Therefore, fours. Therefore, whatever they tell you to do, I'm sorry, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. Okay. Wow. That is a so they were 2,000 years ago, the politicians. Yeah. They were. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, you, you, you know, it would say something, but it really doesn't matter. It doesn't mean a thing, you know, so, but don't do their works. Yeah. All right. All right. What do the scribes and Pharisees lay on people's shoulders? A yoke, a shawl, a cross, or heavy burdens? You know, that used to confuse me as a child because I thought, why in the world would you want an egg? 
anywhere near your uh, you know, an egg. Moisturizer, <laughs> yeah. Isaac, of course. <laughs> you know, the, the funny thing is, when I was getting this quiz ready, I actually typed yolk. Oh. But you know, when, when I was uh -huh. typing instead of yolk, and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, it's not the egg. Uh, you, you know, and I had to change even my typing. So, yeah, I, I understand what you're talking about there. I, I was like, that would be funny, an egg on someone's shoulder, you know. Um, but I see on Facebook that people say, oh, if I get 50 shares or likes or whatever this post, I'll, I'll, I'll egg my brother or my yeah, sister or do something crazy, you know, something, uh, you know, goofy like that. And I'm like, yeah, but, but a shawl, well, it's very interesting that Elijah laid on Elisha, he did. his, his like shawl, mm -hmm. you know, on him. That yeah. was a sign of transferring the now, leadership. A, a sign of transferring the leadership mm -hmm. when from one person one generation to the other so Jesus carried a cross Jesus carried a cross and, he, and Jesus told everybody to take up their cross and follow him now with yolk if that's not the egg yolk what kind of yolk is that okay well instead of the y-o-l-k this is the y-o-k-e this is the yolk like you would put on oxen you know so you know like they would you know yeah. and it was it was always in tandem and always in tandem. So there are two yeah. oxen, one and, yoke. Yeah, and they would use it with criminals and things like that. So, mm -hmm. you know, sort of a... So yoke is yeah. sort of like the collar that pulls the yeah. mm -hmm. wagons or yes. whatnot? Yeah, the collars that pull the wagons. And yeah. that's considered the animal's shoulder, so it could be one. Yeah. Uh, could absolutely. be all of them. Wow. Yeah, could it be all of them. Uh, all right. Verse four. Verse four. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with an, one of their fingers. So they lay on... Well, we forgot to ask everybody what they thought. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's all right. All right. Uh, we gave you another bonus. You, you got a freebie job, there. Mark. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So it was heavy burdens, and they would not move them themselves. What do the scribes and Pharisees make broad? Uh. Their mustaches? <laughs> oh. Oh, okay. Hey. The road to destruction. Their, oh goodness. Phylacteries. Phylacteries. I was going to say psychalacteries. Did you just make that word so, up? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> phylacteries. <laughs> uh, or their doorways. Mm. Yeah. Well, okay. this one you actually have to know. The verse. You know, so. Well, I mean, you could probably get rid of mustaches. Yeah, I hope it's not that, because yeah. there's something really nice about well, a wide mustache. Back then, so. you, you, you know, they're Handlebar. nice uh, handlebar mustaches. Yeah. It, you know, it sounds like a Texas thing with a, you know, you know, you know with a... mustaches. <laughs> All right. Um, wide hmm. is the road to destruction. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, yeah, that, yeah. That, yeah. That fits. Yeah. But we, we got to look at the verse, though, huh? Yeah. Because there's some things there that... I want a dictionary for number three. For, yeah. <laughs> for number three. All right. What does everybody think? All right. All right. We have so uh, a couple of different answers. Of ones, right. a, a three. Those that are answering threes, I think they need to come up here and tell us what a phylactery is. Please. You I know, clearly so, didn't study uh, enough. Oh, I saw hands go down really quick. Yeah. They're like, oh, <laughs> no. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Think, yeah. All um, right. Verse um, five. Um, but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. Yeah. So is it a type of dressing? Yeah. Well, sort of. Yeah. It was, it was a, uh, sometimes it was a box or um, usually a box of some sort that they would wear on their forehead and it would contain uh, scripture passages, rolled up bits of scripture passages. And so the broader the phylactery, the more scripture you could carry in it. And that appeared, uh, you would be very pious for carrying a lot yeah. of scripture on your forehead when I think the intent is to carry it inside well, your forehead, yeah. not yeah. on the front. But it was to be seen by men. Yeah. Uh, you know, to well, say, oh. I, yeah. Like in the pictures that your Bible comes with, I've never seen anyone with a box on their head. Yeah. That get for yeah. Them. Well, yeah. I, I think they didn't know how to uh, <laughs> illustrate it. it yeah. you, you know, really. Where but, people uh, would know what it was. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that box on their forehead um, that they would strap around there, and they would, mm -hmm. like Pastor Isaac said, they put scripture in. So the bigger the box, the yeah. more scripture. So you looked... So uh, this? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, the more righteous you would appear. You know, the more righteous. Guys, 
Yeah. The New King James Version. The New King James Version. Right? You, know, you know, you would be more holy if you had one of the Bibles that had like four side-by-side -side versions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or, or if you had the version of the Bible in Greek or in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you would be, you know. So anyway. All right. Number All five. right. Number five. What do the scribes and Pharisees like to be called in the marketplace? Oh, gosh. Obi-Wan <laughs> Kenobi, son of Abraham, Batman, or Rabbi Rabbi? Yeah. All right, I uh, think we can get rid of two of those pretty quick. Yeah. <laughs> who, who would not want to have yeah. the high ground? Yeah, yeah. Who would not, who, who would not want to have the high ground? They wanted the high ground, you know. Um, and you know, if you're out in the marketplace wanting to be called something, mm -hmm. well, let's face it. I remember those commercials with the football players getting hit, and he's sitting on the sideline and like asking him who he is. He's like, you know, and his head has been, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm Batman. You, you, you know, so. Um, I guess if you want people to call you names in the marketplace, Batman is a good one. You know, so. I'm Batman. Yeah. But, uh, but yes, I think you're right, Pastor Isaac. We can probably get rid of Batman yeah. and uh, Obi-Wan oh, Kenobi. Ben Kenobi, yeah. You know, even though it sounds cool. It yeah. does. Those are more like title names, though, as well. And like, well, Batman isn't really much of a title name. Obi-Wan Kenobi isn't a title name, but... Most people want to be called it as if it was a title name. But you know, the son of Abraham really was a title name. And they did like to, in fact, they even, yeah. they even said that to Jesus once. They said, we are sons of Abraham. Who's your dad? Yeah. That, yeah. Right. Um, Batman? Mm. <laughs> Batman. <laughs> I mean, he's super rich. I mean, oh, sorry. This, we're not talking about Bruce Wayne. I mean, yeah. who's Bruce Wayne? Yeah. So, Batman. Yeah. Right. So what rabbi, we, rabbi, what do we think teacher? It is? Um, I've got some fours. A two, a f well, he's changing his yeah, mind. Yeah, we got some twos and people fours. Change fours. And uh, we can have right. a three. All right. <laughs> yeah. We got some people cheating. All right, verses six to, six to seven say, they love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called by men, rabbi, rabbi. Hmm. So number uh, four. So if you had number four, rabbi, rabbi, teacher, teacher. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be known as the teachers. Sign of great respect. Yeah, yeah. great great respect. It, uh, yeah. It, isn't that something how over 2,000 years, times have changed? <laughs> yes, remarkable. You know, they wanted to be known as a teacher. I, I remember working as a student missionary, and it was a great respect to be a teacher. Everyone held up the teachers, you know, with great respect. Yeah. You know, to today... And, uh, you, you know, I'm sorry for a lot of our teachers because there's a lot of people that don't respect mm -hmm. our teachers today. That's unfortunate. And, and it's very unfortunate. You know, it was to be huge respect. Mm -hmm. All right, last one. The greatest among the disciples would be what? The oldest, a servant, the tallest, or the smartest? It's found mm -hmm. in verse 11. All right, we've got some people giving different answers. Two, uh, there's two, some twos, some four. fours. Um, uh, you know, the greatest disciple, well, let's just think about it. Um, when Saul became king, he was head and shoulders above everyone else. True. Yeah. And so being the tallest was really looked at as, wow. Everyone looked up to him. Everyone looked up to him. You know, so being tall was, uh, was really important. Um, I remember when I was in high school in an academy in Ohio, uh, one of the pastors in the area, Jim Bunch, he was like six foot seven. Oh, and my. all of us kids looked up to him. And all of us were like, wow, we want to be like Pastor Bunch. It, 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 you know, because, you know, everybody looked up to him. Yeah. You know. Um, How's the weather up uh, there? Yeah. But the oldest, in this culture, the oldest was always respected. Absolutely. In fact, even in some of our cultures, you know, if you have an older person, you know, there's a lot of respect. Um, they're usually a lot wiser. They're usually a lot wiser. Um, and even probably the disciples even looked at people who they thought were smart. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Um, so, all right. All Let's right. see what verse 11 what, says. What did verse 11 Everybody say? Everybody thinks too. All right. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. 
Uh, Number two. Yeah, so the greatest would be the servant. The lowest. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the one who would be willing to serve everyone else. And that makes sense. Jesus said something similar. I came right. to serve, not be served. Yeah, I came to serve. And, and he gives us that example in the upper room mm -hmm. where he puts on the, the, the coat and starts washing yep. the feet of the disciples. He shows that he is the servant, yes. even though he was the master. And he broke a few traditions doing that too because oh, yeah. he made himself unclean. Yeah. Unable yeah. to take part in the Passover meal and yet yeah. he still did it. Still yeah. did it. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you for... Uh, sharing in our quiz this morning and uh, I, I know that uh, uh, you know it helps uh, people learn God's word a little bit better and uh, I'm glad for that today our story time is being brought to us by Uncle David uh, Uncle David has a story for us and uh, so we're looking forward to that good morning happy Sabbath uh -huh. I don't know if any of you had the chance to hear the Sabbath school this morning, uh, but this story fits right in with that as far as God sustaining us. <clears throat> so I want to thank Amy and, and Laura for their uh, talks this morning. <clears throat> the story today is called Nails. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> COVID problems. I think I swallowed a fiber for my mask. <clears throat> God cares. <laughs> Why? <laughs> During the middle of the, the summer, a couple of years ago, we got a low tire pressure message on the dash of the car. It was at a time <clears throat> that looking at that light made my heart sink. We didn't have the money for new tires. I knew they were getting worn, but something more pressing always came up. Finally, <clears throat> we took the car in, and sure enough, the nail was in the side of the tire and could not be repaired. It had to be replaced. Paul was demanding and I was thinking about mugging Peter. <clears throat> then the guy at the store looked, up, looked it up and verified we had bought a warranty. We got a new tire almost literally for free. Wow, God blessed us through a nail. And then about a month and a half later, guess what? We got another nail in another tire with a warranty, another new tire. God blessed us through two nails. We tell the kids all the time that God cares about the small things. You know what? He cares about the medium things too, like about $300 worth of tires. And he cares about the big things. He cares about us. So that's why he cares for us and blesses us because he loves us. Sometimes, he uses, he uses two nails. Sometimes he uses three. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. God bless. All right. Thank you. Uncle David. Now it's time for our garden of prayer and praise uh, uh, this morning. We've got uh, prayer requests and, and praises that have been coming in. And uh, so I want to try to mention uh, some of those. Uh, one of our church members here, Terry Flaxbeard and his family. Uh, Terry came down with a case of scabies uh, the, the, this this week, but everything's been clearing up and he's hoping to get back to work tomorrow. So uh, hoping to return to work Where's by that? tomorrow. Good. So I uh, want to keep praying that uh, Carrie, Terry and his family are well and uh, able to uh, uh, keep uh, uh, going. All right. Um, uh, we also had uh, uh, from David Diaz, he's mentioned a few here. He, he's got a co-worker that we've been praying for uh, that had knee surgery. Hmm. He said they're healing well, but uh, pray for continued healing. You know, they're home. They're, and, uh, you know, sometimes when you get home, that's the hardest part after like a knee or hip surgery hmm. because you still have to keep doing the exercises hmm. even though you're not in the hospital. And sometimes that's a lot harder at, at home. 
Uh, so uh, pray that uh, healing uh, keeps taking place. Um, another one of his coworkers uh, lost their grandmother this week, and he's praying for comfort for the family. And uh, as they uh, deal with that, uh, deal with that loss. Um, and uh, I don't know about uh, you all, but uh, the loss of a, a grandparent can can be traumatic on on some of us because uh, I actually found myself having a closer relationship probably with my grandparents than even with my parents. And, uh, you know, I spent summers at my grandparents and everything. So it was, uh, you know, really challenging when I lost my, my grandparents. Um, yeah. So remember them. Yeah. Got a prayer request last night from a, a friend who told me, he said, you know, we're supposed to pray for our leaders. And I said, yeah, the Bible mm -hmm. does say that. He said, we need to remember Donald and Melania. You know, yeah. And, oh, and, absolutely. And some of those other staffers, and you know, and I, I thought, I thought, yeah, absolutely, that's correct. We, we do, uh, as they've been diagnosed with COVID nineteen now, and and then I saw some of the comments, and it, and it made me think, how in the world have we gotten so divided in this world that people are commenting saying, I hope that they suffer. Yeah. I thought, goodness, even if you don't like who our leaders are, we're still supposed to pray for them and lift them up to God. Yeah. Whether we like people or not. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah a absolutely, and um, yeah, we need to remember our our our, our leaders because yeah. whether you like them or not, they are still in a position of trying to lead the country. We ask, you know, that, that you know, so uh, it's a it's a challenging time, mm -hmm. you know, it for is. them and uh, yeah. their 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 family. Yeah. You know, even if you don't like what they're doing with the country, think of them as people. They are yeah, still people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think of them as people. And uh, um, I, from the comments and things that I've seen from other people who have had COVID, um, it's something they don't wish on anyone. Yeah. You, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, on anyone. Mm -hmm. And so we need to remember them in prayer. Uh, Uncle David also has a student, a virtual student, whose entire family has come down with COVID oh, here my. in the, the greater Keene area. So, uh, want to remember them in, in prayer. Um, we have another person praying for their coworker um, and manager at work. Um, uh, their manager at work uh, was uh, diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but they've gotten medication and uh, they've been able to uh, do better on the medication. Mm. Good. Which is which is fantastic. Um, I remember sitting in a seminar with Dr. Nedley. Some of you are familiar with Dr. Nedley, you know, out at Weimar, and uh, you, you know, and he talked about people who are truly bipolar, you know, and uh, he said medicine really helps them, you know, immensely. And uh, so, um, so praise the Lord um, for that, and. Uh, um, and they want to lift up their coworkers in general, um, coworkers in general. And there's um, a, another member of ours, uh, Carol Ann Bivens, many of you know her, is waiting on some test results. She does not feel like she has COVID, but for the sake of the, her family and friends in her life, she is being tested. She felt sick. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, want to uh, remember Angie. Armstrong in prayer, if you were looking in your bulletin and following along, you noticed that she was supposed to be here, but uh, she got sick and not feeling well, went into the hospital last night, uh, and they have diagnosed her with pneumonia. So I uh, want to remember her in prayer, and they want to pray. She was tested for uh, um, COVID, but uh, of course they don't have those results back, but uh, praying that it's not COVID and, it, and but the doctors are pretty sure at least she said that they, they well they have to test for everything but the doctors last night she said we're pretty sure that it's just pneumonia you know so uh, uh, just to remember um, her something yeah. else too y'all may have mentioned this last week I, I was out but uh, we have we have numerous teachers in our in our uh, congregation and one of those teachers works at a school for um, challenging students and some of some of the students shot and killed another student. Not at, not at school, it was uh, outside of school, but that's, that's a lot of pain that's yeah. uh, happening in, in all of the families. Yeah, uh, absolutely. For the student who lost his life, for the members you know, of that student's family, and for the ones that took a life. Um, yeah. So. 
him. Uh, <clears throat> Sonia Varela has uh, said that her sister's father-in-law has recovered from COVID mm, and pneumonia. God. And, uh, and uh, praise the Lord, she said, because he's 80 years old. Oh, he's in and, that high-risk category. In uh, that high-risk category, and he, he recovered. Um, we uh, also, Don Simmons mentioned his mother as she travels back to Florida. And uh, he said the last time she traveled, um, uh, sitting that long in mm -hmm. one location, uh, fluids would build up. You know, and some of you know, with poor circulation, fluids can build up. And so um, just pray that uh, the Lord is with her and she doesn't have fluid retention and, and, and uh, uh, with heart issues and, and everything that sitting for long periods of time uh, can, can cause. Um, and then I had another one here for unspoken. And just like to, you know, reach out there. How many of you have maybe an unspoken prayer request that you just want to remember uh, this morning? Yes. We want to lift those up uh, to the Lord this morning. All right. Um, I also want to remember um, uh, some good friends of ours uh, back in Pennsylvania. Uh, and they're, um, a, a friend of ours, Jim Bowman, passed away yesterday morning. Um, his, his wife is in a nursing home right now with uh, multiple sclerosis, you know, and she's been pretty down a long time, but, uh, and, um, and their son, uh, Siante, he's, he's had some mental challenges. He went into the military and, uh, was hit with IUDs three times. Huh? I IEDs, not IUDs, uh, IEDs. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah. Uh, IEDs. Yeah. Uh, uh, three different times, and uh, which caused some trauma with him. And now his stepfather passed away yesterday. Mm. Um, and uh, so just like a prayer for them, um, they uh, are, are good friends of ours. And um, How old uh, is the son? Uh, he's 30s or 30, 40s? right around 30, somewhere oh, around there. Just curious. Um, it's a... Uh, yeah, probably, probably around 30, 31, somewhere right around there, because that's, I'm trying to remember the age he was. Um, because the interesting thing about it, they, they've been close to us uh, since I first became a pastor. Hmm. Um, and we had our son, Caleb, and we're there in the hospital. Uh, they, uh, out of the people that came to the hospital, mm -hmm. uh, there was one other lady and then them who came to the hospital uh, to see us after Caleb was born in the hospital. And so they've been, you know, yeah, pretty close to us uh, for, uh, for, for quite a while. And uh, I know that Siante is, is hurting, you know, uh, right now. And so we just want to have prayer for the, for the family uh, as well. But uh, let's all... Uh, kneel then as far as possible as we sing our prayer song, Now, Dear Lord, as we pray. Now, dear Lord, as we pray, take our hearts and minds far away from the press of the world all around to your throne where grace does abound. May our lives be transformed by your love. May your souls be refreshed from above. At this moment, let people everywhere join us now as we come to you in prayer. Oh, Lord, we come to you this morning, Lord, with many burdens on our hearts. Lord, um, we, we have family who are sick and, and not feeling well. We have friends and, and family who are suffering losses. Lord, I just pray that your presence will be felt by our friends, our family, our loved ones, 
Lord, may they feel right now as we are praying this morning, may, may your angels that attend them, may they give them hugs and may they feel your presence. May they know that we are praying for them. Lord, we thank you for what you are doing in the lives of others that have gotten well um, from, from COVID or uh, other illnesses and sicknesses. Lord, I, I, I thank you and praise you for, for the, the healing touch that so many have received. But Lord, I just pray that whether there is healing or there isn't healing, that people will continue to put their faith and trust in you. That although we are in this battle, that you have won the war. And Lord, we know that Satan wants to take as many as possible with him. And so Lord, please help us not to lose heart in the face of challenges, in, in the face of illnesses, even if, even if your answer is no, not yet. May we put our faith and trust in you and know that ultimately you are the victor. And Lord, I pray that you will come close to those who are at home today, whether by choice or even not by choice, but maybe by health or other reasons. And I pray that you will watch over them. Be with those who are watching from multiple locations around the world. Lord, may we feel your presence today and may your Holy Spirit move on our hearts as Pastor Isaac speaks to us. May your word enliven us and change us so that we can leave this place closer to you today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Scripture today, Andrew, you have our scripture for us today from Hosea 6, verse 6. Yes, Pastor, I do. I'm reading from my Bible today, and it says, <clears throat> For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Mm. Mm. All right. All right. Thank you. Well, now Pastor Isaac's going to share with Absolutely. Us. And I'm going to make my way over here and... I'm going to risk an open water bottle here. <clears throat> we'll do our best not to, not to dump it over. <clears throat> Before I begin, I would invite you to just uh, bow your heads with me as I say, say a, a, a brief prayer. Lord God, you know me, you know us. You know that I don't always say the things the way it should be said, and you know all of us don't always hear the things the way we're supposed to. So right now, in this time that we spend together, I ask that you would use the words that come out of my mouth, and you would translate them where needed, that they would be the words that each of us need to hear. And I thank you, Lord. Thank you for your power, your graciousness, and thank you for joining us this morning. In your name we pray, amen. So, again, you see, <clears throat> I, uh, I am going to be preaching a little bit of a, of a metaphorical mountain. It's the mountain of compassion over and above condemnation. And I'd like to begin with a story. I think I've shared this story before, but it fits so well with what was, what's going on here. And uh, I'll explain how it fits as we, as we go through this. So when I first moved up to this area, I was, um, let's see, it was back in the early 2000, yeah, right, right around 2000, I think. 
And I uh, had, had not been a woodworker or anything of, of the sort at that time, <clears throat> but I had been a tree trimmer. And I still had all of my, my gear, the chainsaws, the pole saw, the ropes, uh, safety harness, everything like that. Still do. And I thought, well, that's what I'll do. I need to find a job. And so I started looking at these uh, different tree trimming companies in the area. And I hit on one called Jackson Brothers Tree Service. And uh, did an interview, and I was hired, and I thought, fantastic, this is working out great. And it did. Um, I was hired on as one of the tree trimmers, and it was a small, we only had a few employees there, and so it was kind of small. We, uh, we trimmed the trees and we cleaned up the brush. But uh, still, it was a job, and it was a good job. Well, <clears throat> eventually, I was taking out uh, my own crew, and we, were, uh, we had two crews at that point, and uh, when another gentleman was taking out a crew, and I would take out a crew, and one of the jobs that I showed up on was a big post oak. Um, and for those of you that know post oaks, it's a very heavy wood, very dense wood. And it was about, oh, about that big around, I think. <clears throat> and it was right next to, it was about a foot and a half off of the roof near the garage and about that same distance away from the, the, um, the driveway. And I have seen this personally. I have not done it, thank goodness. But I've seen this where you drop a large enough piece of wood onto concrete. And wood is very heavy. And it can, it can break the concrete. It can just punch a hole right into the driveway. So I've seen that done, and I thought, I didn't want to drop any heavy chunks of wood on this driveway. I certainly don't want to drop anything on the roof. And so what you do is you, when you, you, you climb up in the tree, and one of your ropes, of course, is tied into the tree and on your safety harness. Make sure you don't fall too far. And the other rope you use to cut small pieces out of the tree. Someone is on the ground holding one end of the rope. The other end of the rope goes up over a limb and you tie it off to the piece that you're cutting, and then they lower that piece down to the ground safely and uh, untie it and raise the rope back up, and you do that over and over until you get the whole tree down. And pretty soon you're just down to stumps and you're you know, cutting smaller and smaller pieces off so you're not punching big holes in the ground as you drop those off. And we got the tree down safely. No holes punched in the sidewalk, no holes punched in the ground beyond small divots here and there. And, and um, it did take quite a bit of the day. I think we probably spent about seven hours taking this tree down. But I was very pleased with the work because nothing was damaged. I thought, okay, that's all right. It did take a long time, but we didn't damage anything. That's okay. Job well done in my book. And I got back and we, we got back to where, uh, to the shop, put all the tools away. And, and uh, later on in the week, that may have been a Monday, later on in the week, maybe a, a Wednesday, my boss, the, the owner of the company, came to me and he said, uh, it was after work one day, Maybe I was tired. I really don't remember exactly what was going on at the time, but I do remember my response. He came to me and he said, <clears throat> um, Isaac, that tree you cut down the other day. And I said, yeah, the post oak. He said, yeah, right there by the, the house in the driveway. I said, that, yeah. He said, uh, you took a really long time doing that. Um, I'd really appreciate it if you'd speed, the, speed up a little bit. And right then and there, something called my, uh, my ego and my pride, and uh, I don't know what else mixed in. It all jumped in the jumble together. And I said something I shouldn't have. <laughs> and I said, I said, when's the last time you were up in a tree? <laughs> to my boss. And um, <laughs> that didn't go over too well. I did manage to retain my job, no thanks to anything I said after that. My foreman, uh, he and I were good friends. He knew the kind of work I did. He talked the boss into not firing me that day. Um, and I, I found that out later because my boss just looked at me and turned around and walked away. And I thought, well, that's, you know, that's a better response than I had for him. Um, and the next job, the next time we all, it was a big job. Huge, huge cottonwood in the backyard. There were stumps to grind. We had a stump grinder and uh, uh, several trees to trim. This cottonwood was one of, you, you, those of you know cottonwoods, they grow incredibly large. They're also prone to breaking. So, um, this one needed some large dead wood taken out of it, some large limbs that were over the porch and over the roof taken out. And I was, uh, I was pulling on my, my climbing harness, and my boss walked by me and said, no, 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 you can, uh, you can stay on the ground today. I'm going up in the tree. I said, okay, all right. Guess I earned that. And, um, and then I went to go drive the stump grinder in the backyard. He said, no, 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 you just stand over there and watch. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll drive this. And I think he, he was feeling like he needed to prove something because of what I'd said. 
And he drove that stump grinder right up onto a big pile of wood and tipped it over and it started smoking. And, and I just stood back and watched like he'd asked me to do. And uh, then he got up in the tree. And um, in the process of trimming this tree, there were two, two uh, he and another, my foreman were up there. In the process of trimming the tree, he dropped several limbs through the porch roof. He swung a limb out and knocked off the, the uh, TV antenna off the top of the roof of the house and, and created several other uh, incidents that we had to come back and fix. And I didn't say a word. My lips were sealed. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. Uh, I figured that was good enough. You know, I, I didn't have to say anything. But from that time on, from the time that I said what I said, when he came to me and said, you know, you really took a long time with that tree. Because of my response to him, it soured our relationship. Uh, right up until the day that I left the company and went to work somewhere else, it soured our relationship. All right. We'll keep going, and we're going to come back to this after a while. Now, when, as, I was, as I was working my way through this sermon, I had a very specific idea of where we were going to go. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 23. That's where the quiz came from. Then we're going to move on to Matthew chapter 12 because there's a specific story, a passage in there that we want to examine. And then Matthew 9, another story, another passage that is very pertinent to the sermon. And then Hosea chapter 6 where our, uh, Andrew read the, the uh, scripture reading from. And the more I moved through this sermon, the more I realized I may have been a little overambitious to fit all of this into one sermon. So we'll see how far we go today, and there may be a part two. Just wanted to let you know about that. So Matthew chapter 23, and this is a passage that uh, once I get going, I think you guys are going to know exactly uh, what this passage is. We call it the, the seven woes, and... Um, not woe like you would rein a horse in, but a woe like uh, terrible things are about to happen, that type of woe. And, and Jesus is speaking, and he's not just speaking on a mountainside or in the, in the streets of Jerusalem or Jericho or any other place. He is speaking in the temple. All right, so this is a special place. Teachers would go and they would often speak to their, their, uh, their acolytes or their disciples, and sometimes in, in the, the temple gate areas. Or, and we don't know exactly where Jesus was in the temple, but when he was done speaking, it says he went out of the temple in Matthew chapter 24. So we know he's in the temple speaking, and that's an odd place to be in the temple speaking and to immediately launch into the Pharisees and the scribes, and not in a nice way. At least that's what it appears on the surface. So we're going to come back and we're going to go through this. I'm going to keep these um, passages here that I can come back and look at. I printed it all out, so I'm not having to look it up. But we're going to see a snapshot today. As we move through these passages, we're going to see a snapshot of just how much Jesus treasured compassion over condemnation. And I know that's a weird thing, because we're talking about what essentially amounts to Jesus condemning the scribes and the Pharisees. Maybe. Let's look at it a little more. But it's going to be a bit of a, a journey. I told you how we're going to move from Matthew 23 to Matthew 12, then Matthew 9, and back to Hosea chapter 6 in the Old Testament. But first, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 23. And this, this chapter, it really helps us to understand the Pharisaic system. The, uh, like, like any system that puts its emphasis on rules and regulations, this easily, not always, but easily could degenerate into the observance of requirements that were, of course, um, well, they were intended to help people along the road to godliness, but the observance of the requirements, they could easily become an end in themselves. In other words, when you're observing the rules, you get to be the, where the rules are more important than where the rules are taking you. Hmm. So, when this happened, this causes the appearance of godliness or the appearance of righteousness, but not the reality of. So for the Pharisees, the correct performance of outward rites and the firm hold on strict, the strict teaching of these rites, these became the end in themselves. And the genuinely selfless, other-centered, caring relationships suffered because of it. You know, the way this chapter starts, it reminds me of something... Um, how many of you, and don't raise your hand, 
<clears throat> this is not a, a question that I'm asking for you to raise your hand about. Uh, how many of you, just think, have ever been talking about someone else and then the other person kind of shows up on the edges or walks into the group and it's a little bit awkward or embarrassing? Has that, you know, ever happened? And don't, don't raise your hands. Um, you know, I've, I've been there. I've, I've done that. I've been talking about someone and they showed up and I realized, wow, and I thought to myself, I wonder how much they heard. I wonder, do I need to apologize? I wonder, you know, that's, that's not a good place to be. It's not a good thing to do, but it happens. Sometimes quite often, sometimes not. Well, and that would also depend on why we're talking about them. If we're saying good things about them, then we kind of want them to hear that, right? But uh, what about Jesus here? Notice how Jesus starts out in chapter 23. He's talking about the Pharisees. So he's not talking to the Pharisees at this point. He's just talking about the Pharisees to the people who've gathered to listen to him. And they're all in the temple, the place where Pharisees and scribes tend to hang out. So it was a common enough place for teachers to speak, but Jesus had to know, it's again, not by accident, Jesus had to know that once he started talking about the Pharisees in the temple, they were likely going to hear about it and come to see what was this all about. Maybe listen in, get some more ammo against Jesus, just to see what he was saying. And in fact, though, Jesus only talks about the Pharisees for the first 12 verses. Just verses 1 through, 1 through 12. And then starting in verse 13, Jesus begins to talk specifically to the scribes and the Pharisees. It makes me wonder, Jesus planned this out pretty well. He's going to talk about the Pharisees for just a few minutes. The Pharisees are going to be uh, uh, curious. Someone, someone's going to pass the word back to them and say, hey, that preacher, the one from Galilee, he is really running you guys down. You got to come hear what he's saying. And they do. They show up. They show up. And then Jesus begins to talk to them, not just about them. And in those first 12 verses, Jesus isn't condemning so much as he is... I'm, I'm asking you to look at this in a different perspective than perhaps what you have looked at it previously when you read this passage, this story. So he isn't condemning so much as he is pointing out the things that the Pharisees do to search out honor and recognition here on this earth for themselves. And he's advising the people not to be like that. Don't be like that. And then in verses 12, I'm sorry, 13 through 28, and when it comes to some of what looks like his harshest language directed immediately at the religious leaders, he uses a specific phrase that, again, on first inspection, it looks to be condemnation. He says, woe to you. And I've always read that phrase as sort of a, a, a formula, a formulaic way of saying, um, bad things are surely getting ready to come your way because, and then he fills in the rest of the phrase. And he, he says that seven times. He says, woe to you. So bad things are coming your way because, and then you finish the phrase. And just to be clear, you know, he says it seven times. It's not a mistake. But let's go back and get a feel for what he's talking about in each of those times that at first glance seem to be a pretty serious condemnation. So let's talk about this phrase first because I want you to make sure that, uh, that we're all on the same page with what it means here. When I looked it up according to the context and how it's translated from the original language, there's a heavy tone of sadness or condom, not, not, I'm sorry, not condemnation, uh, lamentation associated with this word woe. It's sadness and lamentations or grief. It's a crying out of sorts. He says, you're causing yourselves much sadness by the things that you're doing. In fact, it would be appropriate to say Jesus was saying in this phrase, woe to you. He says, you're causing yourselves so much sadness by the things you're doing and you're condemning yourselves by your very actions. I don't think that Jesus was standing there condemning the, uh, that Jesus was actually standing there condemning the Pharisees. He was, he was saying your actions are condemning yourself. So, verse 13. Let's look at that real quick. But woe to you. Now, now they're, they're here. They're listening. And he begins to speak to them. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. 
Now, today, in, in today's world, when we call someone a hypocrite, it means something a little bit different than what Jesus was doing. Uh, he was calling them a hypocrite. A hypocrite was another word for an actor, a, um, a stage actor, because they would wear two faces. They had a, a face that they could hold up uh, that would show uh, happy or, or glad, or, or they had another face, depending on what part they were playing, that could show anger or sadness. So he was calling them two-faced, but he was calling them more of an actor. They were acting. So anyway, he says, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. He wants them to wake up to the fact that not only are they refusing to enter into the humility that's needed to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, they're teaching others to do the same thing and keeping them out by that teaching. He wants them to see the great sadness and the grief that they're causing themselves because of that. And 14, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses and for a pretense you make long prayers. And we've talked about that. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. How much sadness and grief are they causing themselves by their own selfishness and greed? Two things that have absolutely no place in the kingdom of heaven. Then on top of that, they're hurting themselves more as they seek to draw attention to themselves by their long and empty prayers, empty of any real relationship with God. And verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel over sea and land to make one proselyte, one convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. How much sadness and grief are they causing themselves when they seem to work so hard at making a convert to their faith? But since their faith is made up of self-glorification and self-gratification, They've only succeeded in someone, creating someone who will end up being just like them. And it's causing themselves much grief and sadness. 16, woe to you, blind guides who say, whoever, this is a little bit longer of a passage, whoever swears by the temple, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated. You fools and blind men. Which is more important, the gold or the temple that sanctified the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the offering on it, he is obligated. You blind men, which is more important, the offerings or the altar that sanctifies the offering? Therefore, whoever swears by the altar swears both by the altar and everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears both by the temple and by him who dwells within it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by both the throne of God and by him who sits on it. How much sadness and grief. This is Jesus speaking directly to the religious folk. How much sadness and grief are you causing yourselves as they willfully ignore what makes the temple a holy place? You know, it's striking to me that Jesus references blindness three times in this passage. And the first reference is full of a, the potential for grief and sadness because of the Pharisees and those that they lead. They're choosing to not only be blind to the reality of God's holiness, but they're leading others into the same way of thinking. Jesus uses that phrase, blind guides, back in Matthew 15 as well. This is the second time he's alerted both the Pharisees and those that follow the Pharisees to their blindness. Jesus asks a very important question about what makes a thing holy. He's asking the most literate scholars in the area right now. He's speaking directly to them. What makes a thing holy? You know, the, uh, the Pharisees were in the habit of saying that the golden items and the golden adornments of the temple were important enough to hold a person to their oath. If someone swore, now in biblical times, uh, in the terminology there, swearing is simply another term for uh, taking an oath or a promise, all right? It's just wanted to make sure we're on that same page here. We're not talking about the four-letter words. And back to what the Pharisees were saying about taking an oath by the gold of the temple. Jesus gets to the heart of the issue, as he so often does. 
he asks this important question, what makes a thing holy? In this case, the gold. And he tracks back from that. He goes from the gold to the temple and back to what ultimately makes the temple holy, which is God, of course. And I believe this is a question that needs to reverberate, needs to bounce around inside of our minds. Even today, as this building is often considered to be a house of God. I've heard that phrase used. And I will absolutely state that it is indeed a house of worship where we invite God's presence to be. But what draws God's presence here today? What compels him to be here today? It has, well, people. People do, always and forever, people. It has absolutely nothing to do with the costliness of the decorations we use. It has the, nothing to do with the color of the paint or the, the cushiness of the pews or the quality of the carpet. None of that entices God to be here with us. Humans are his pride and joy. Humans are the apple of his eye. Paul uses this term in Ephesians 2.10. I absolutely love this passage. And he's describing what we are, what mankind is to God. And I know your translations may use a slightly different word here, so I thought I would reference the Greek word. Sometimes the word is, we are God's masterpiece, or we are God's workmanship. It's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And so different words are used there, and I thought, let's just go back to the original word. The Greek word there is, is, a, is a word that we still derive some of our words from today. You might even recognize this word, even though this is Greek. It's very similar to an English word, a word that we still use today to describe something beautiful or something um, that lifts the spirit up, in most cases anyway. Paul says that we are God's poema, that we are God's poema. That is where we get our current word of poem from. We are God's artistry, his masterpiece. We are his poem. Did you ever think of yourself as poetry? Probably not. You know, when you wake up first thing in the morning, your hair, you know, your breath. You're poetry to God. You are precious to him. And so I really like that word. And God has invested all he has in us. He's invested everything. There was nothing that he held back when it came to redeeming us back to himself. And what's more, we have the privilege of inviting him into our minds through the Holy Spirit. The Jewish temple had at one time the living presence of God. Do you remember in, in, the, the, um, in the, the wilderness when the, the tabernacle was, was uh, dedicated and the presence of God filled the most holy place such that the people couldn't even stand to look at it and all the priests had to back away from it because the presence of God was there. And, and from that point on, the Shekinah glory, it was a, a portion of God's holiness dwelt above the, the Ark of the Covenant. And the priests could only go in there once a year. It was such an incredible experience. A portion of God's Spirit used to dwell in the temple. And now, we get to carry that presence in us wherever we go. We carry God with us. He doesn't reside in these man-made walls, no matter how nice they are, no matter how well-appointed or decorated they are, or how much money we have spent on them. That doesn't entice God to be here. Those are just niceties for us. Let's be honest with ourselves. God desires above all else a willing and honest heart and mind. That's what he desires. A, a heart that's willing to have him come in and make the changes that he sees fit. Now, got a little sidetracked, but Jesus was making a very serious statement about what makes anything holy and is always and only God himself. So what right would the creature have to take an oath using his or her creator's name? I would say absolutely none at all. I know I kind of lumped several of the woes in there because we, we covered several passages in that with the blindness reference. But Jesus was truly asking them to instead of being willfully blind, he was asking them to open their eyes and look and see just how valuable people are to God. Not the things that we think are valuable, but people. 
the very people that the Pharisees were leading into willful blindness by their teachings. So we're going to move on to the final woe, starting in verse 27. And he says this, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, while on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness which is a funny thing, a funny way to describe the Pharisees that kept the law to a T. That was their favorite thing, going to keep the law right down to the letter of it. It was unfortunate. How much sadness and grief were the Pharisees causing themselves as they struggled to maintain an appearance of righteousness to the people that they taught and led even though each of these woes feels very much like a condemnation, I also think about how much Jesus desires all of mankind to be saved from the worst criminal who, to the person who never committed a crime, from the most self-righteous of religious folk who pridefully refuse to see any errors that they may have to the folk who know they're not worthy of God's love, of God's salvation, of God's free gift of eternal life. These woes that Jesus pronounced, to me, taking all that into context, they seem a lot more like a deeply impassioned plea on Jesus' part to a group of men who really struggled with their own egos and pride. And if you can raise your hand right now and say you never struggle with your ego, you never struggle with your pride, well, my hat's off to you. But I think as humans, we do. We struggle with our ego. We struggle with our pride. We struggle when people come to us and say things that immediately sound like an attack because our pride gets in the mix. Our ego jumps in there, and it sounds like an attack. I sometimes wonder what would have happened to my relationship with my boss at the tree trimming company if I'd simply listened to him and just taken into account what he was saying as a learning moment rather than letting my ego and my pride run wild getting angry because I felt attacked, I effectively ruined a good relationship. Before that, he and I had had a pretty decent relationship, and I ruined it by letting my pride and ego get mixed into that. I think another term for that is willful blindness. Often, you know, it is easy to feel condemned, to feel like we're simply being attacked, and I wonder... As I read this this week, I, I wondered how many of those Pharisees who heard Jesus' words felt attacked. How many grew embittered and hardened because of what he was saying to them, because of what he was showing them, how much grief and sadness that they were causing themselves and the ones who followed them. But I also wondered how many heard those words and began honestly and openly examining themselves in the light that God willingly gives. We just have to ask. And he gives it to us. He gives us light that lets us examine ourselves as we compare ourselves to the life of Jesus Christ. How many of us today will hear the words of Jesus and will openly and honestly examine ourselves in the light that God is so willing to shine into our hearts and minds? I hope that you would take that as a challenge, not an attack. And I think we're going to see more about why this is a challenge and not an attack as we, as we uh, see part two of this, where we go to Matthew chapter 12 and Matthew chapter 9 and Hosea chapter 6. Because this is some of, some of those passages, they really reveal the deepest part of the heart of God, his yearning for us. And Jesus didn't come here to attack he came here to shine a light on each of our lives. He was doing it with them, and he still does it with us today. He shines a light. He allows us to see what we look like if we're willing to look openly and honestly at ourselves in his light, not comparing myself to anyone else. That never works because you can always find someone who's worse than you, and you can always find someone who's better than you. It never works to compare yourself to others 
So I'm going to challenge you today. Just compare yourself to Jesus. Let him shine that light in. And then examine it. Push your ego out. Push your pride out. And don't let it get mixed into that, uh, that jumbled up together. Anyway, we'll explore more in part two. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Pastor Isaac. Yeah, it, uh, it's challenging. Now we're going to stand and sing our closing hymn together, 579, Tis Love That Makes Us Happy. So let's stand and sing <coughs> together. <laughs> Father in heaven, Lord, help us to see, truly see, the words that you've given us, the words you've given us in your holy word, and the words you continually give us day by day. You speak to us in so many different ways, Lord, and so often we do allow our sinful nature to confuse those words and to take them as attacks. Lord, you desire the best for us. Every day, every moment of our lives, you desire what's best. Help us to see that clearly and to examine ourselves in your light as we go out about our life, our day-to-day -day life. In your name we pray, amen. <clears throat>